I think we're just at the 2 p.m. mark. Could I just ask our panelists, uh, Vindya and Tiaz, if you guys could just switch on your videos as well? Thank you. And uh, MTS as well, if you are in the call. For the people who have just joined in, uh, thank you very much for your time today. Um, just before we get started, I uh, want to reiterate to please keep your mics and cameras turned off so that we can very clearly hear and see uh, esteemed panel. And uh, I've also just posted a link in the chat to just get a quick understanding of uh, where, where you are positioned in the analytics industry. Are you a newcomer to the field? Are you someone who uh, is not in the industry right now but wants to get in? So maybe just go and submit your answer there in the duration of this chat. If you have any questions, please do add them to the chat as we go along. We'll do our best to answer as many as them, many of them as possible if, if time permits. So with that, uh, I think we'll get started. Firstly, as ways of introduction, uh, I'm Adil, uh, Energy Delivery Associate here working at Octave. And I'm delighted to have three panelists today that I'm also fortunate to have the pleasure of working with. Uh, first up, we have Mr. Yusuf Isam. Yusuf is one of our analytics delivery principals here. And he's worked primarily with uh, clients in the FDG industry. Uh, next, we have Ms. Vindya Mahavitana. She's also part of our delivery team as an analytics delivery manager, uh, handling customers in the FMC space as well as in retail. And finally, last but certainly not least, is Mr. Imtiaz Rizam. Imtiaz is the head of our business intelligence department and the man behind all of the incredible visualizations and the end products that our consumers interface with. Yeah. Um, with the introduction to the side, I think data analytics is an industry is, which is very trendy topic these days, and a lot of people want to get involved. And I think maybe we can just go around the room and get kind of your journey to how you, how you got, came to be where you are at right now. Maybe Yusuf will start with you. How is it, what was it about analytics that interested you, and how did you get to where you are today here at Octave? Hi Adil, thanks and uh, thanks to everyone for joining this session. Uh, it's a privilege to talk about this topic that uh, you know is close to all of our hearts. Uh, so Adil, my um, my initial education was in IT, so I've always had a soft spot for things, uh, all things data and all things IT. Uh, but since then, I took on a number of roles in different um, uh, customer facing and uh, business development roles, as well as most latterly, I was in um, a business growth role looking constantly at uh, sort of sales numbers, uh, pipelines, uh, performance KPIs, areas like that. So uh, I thought, uh, you know, uh, the next level is happening everywhere out there. And uh, I was in the uh, services industry and uh, the IT services industry. So I thought, hey, uh, this is something that's very familiar to me. And uh, I would love to take my capabilities to the next level by working with uh, uh, well, in our case, a conglomerate like JKH with uh, access to uh, the different uh, industry verticals, uh, but the overall uh, stream at large. Yeah, so uh, business to tech to business to analytics, I guess, is my journey. Yeah. But you've always been in an industry quite tangential to analytics, so you can see the the obvious next step there. Vindya, what about yourself? Have you also, I think, been in an industry where you've seen it as like a not not a major shift essentially some uh, a, a very natural next step uh, thanks adil and uh, good afternoon everyone so my journey um, has been quite different actually um so when i started off um my qualifications were also in it but then i pivoted to something completely different which was the aviation sector and i was involved in a lot of operational work there and but I also realized that even in the aviation sector, 
there was a lot of work that we did with data and there was a lot of data. So this big data came into the airline industry quite early because we were gathering so much of passenger information, flight information. So therefore, I understood the value of data and we were doing a lot of analytics, perhaps not advanced analytics like the work we do right now at Octave, but we were doing a lot of business intelligence and analytics. And therefore, uh, for me, uh, the journey was quite interesting because I was uh, in this particular field and it was quite uh, limited to one area. And I wanted to expand my horizon and work in multiple fields. And Octave has given me that opportunity to actually work across uh, multiple sectors in industries that I've had uh, no experience in and uh, just explore uh, where I can further my career. So that's been my journey with Octave so far. Fantastic. I think you mentioned a, a career pivot, and I think that's something that a lot of the audience can relate to as well, given that a lot of them are saying that they don't currently study or work in the background of analytics. That's correct. Imtia, yeah. similar to, to India, I think you've had a significant career pivot that you've kind of driven by yourself, right, with your passion uh, for analytics. Yes, Sadhya. So uh, before answering that question, I would like to, you know, uh, welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining this session. Um, so Adil, uh, for me, uh, it has been a significant change um, because I started my career as an internal auditor uh, working for one of the uh, big four audit firms. And then uh, having that same experience, I moved to JKH as well again, was working in the internal audit department. And uh, while working, I was given the opportunity to handle a particular project that was more towards um, analyzing data and uh, identifying trends and patterns, etc. So this particular project, uh, you know, gave me the interest to move into this area. So uh, using some of those, uh, you know, basic knowledge, uh, I tried to do some of my, you know, own uh, data analysis work uh, using certain visualization tools and all. Um, so having that experience is what, you know, uh, made me where I am today. So I had to do a lot of, you know, self-learning um, to get to where I am. Uh, and then obviously Octave is a place where, you know, uh, there are a lot of um, a different areas and different technologies uh, that we use. So it gave me the interest to uh, work at Octave. So here I am at Octave. Fantastic stuff. I mean, I think there's there's one common theme here that uh, that's across all three of you, which is that again that passion and eagerness to be on the cutting edge of technology and work in a in a field that's constantly seeing advancements, right? Yeah. I think we can get into now uh, since we do have two uh, delivery uh, personnel on the panel. Maybe Yusuf, I'll start with you. Could you kind of explain to the wide audience here what exactly is it that you, as a uh, principal delivery, what do you do on a day to day basis? What are the kind of tasks and skills and competencies that you see yourself using and that you see yourself gr growing and building uh, in, in your career as a data analytics professional now? Uh, sure, Adil. I think uh, I would love to be able to explain my uh, role uh, and the kind of thing we do uh, in, in simple terms, like, you know, where if I were a baker, where I would sort of uh, bake the, buy the flour, uh, make the dough, uh, you know, roll it out, uh, put the uh, bake the bread and then uh, put it out in the display or delivery. That would be very nice. Uh, but I think the work's a little different here because uh, a lot of what we have to deliver is not necessarily clear at the outset. So uh, there's a lot of very exploratory uh, work that needs to be done where we we know that certain things can be done. We know that there are certain things that uh, there are opportunities there to be taken. But every customer is different and uh, the scenario that uh, they have to deal with is different. So uh, I would say that one of the most uh, important areas I spend time uh, in my day to day job is to really getting getting to the heart of a problem that uh, adds value to the customer to be solved. Uh, what is important to the customer? And, uh, you know, if I take an example uh, to many customers, for example, reducing cost would be a simple thing that uh, would be an objective that would be useful. So uh, we would then look at, for example, what drives that cost reduction and uh, at what cost does that cost reduction come? Do you trade it off against something else? So having those discussions, understanding from the stakeholders um, what it means to uh, be helpful to them. Uh, 
uh, is, is, a, is a big part of uh, what we do. And then, of course, uh, from a delivery perspective, we work with the other specialists, the data specialists in the data science teams and the platform and data engineering teams. And we, we come together as a team and, uh, you know, keep the ball rolling from a project management point of view. Uh, but ultimately, we do spend a lot of time with the customer as well, helping them uh, understand and uh, sort of co-developing solutions and calculating the value and the impact at the end of it together. So, uh, yeah, I, I would say a lot of time spent uh, uh, identifying problems and then uh, project managing and then um, uh, measuring success. Yeah. yeah, I think across those three points you've mentioned, yeah, there's the common theme of uh, having to be an effective communicator, right? Whether it be with your clients, whether it would be with your team members, whether it would be translating what exactly it is you're doing with your analytics interventions or solutions, you've got to be able to communicate it well, I suppose. And Vindya, I, I mean, I know that you work a lot, uh, again, in the delivery team with translating complex technical uh, methodologies to the people on the ground level who actually have to see the impact and understand what it is. How difficult is it to bridge that knowledge gap and how important is it to speak the same language? Um, so I'll uh, uh, to expand end on that and more on what you so mentioned. Basically, um, it is very important that you are able to connect with your client, understand their business problems, and then come up with a solution. And at the end of it, um, have a good story to explain that uh, solution to them because the it's very important that we have a buy-in from our customers on the solution that we are presenting. I mean, we can come up with a very technical, um, a very illustrious solution, but at the end of the day, if it does not speak to the ground level staff uh, of a client who are going to execute this solution day in and day out, if they don't see the value, if we are not able to explain the solution in simple terms to the ground level staff, see how their life improves and therefore uh, there is a benefit from the work that we are doing, uh, there won't be buy-in and over a period of time, the value that we bring in cannot be sustained. So, I mean, we can start off um, having a very interesting um, use case or a project. Um, we can show them value for an initial period, but then for that to sustain, there has to be buy-in from ground level up on what we are delivering. So uh, what we try to do when we engage with the clients on projects is to have them involved from day one so that they feel that they are also building this solution with us. It's not like we come up with a solution and we are trying to force it on them. They are part of the journey. They are there every step of the way and they are part of the solution. So then once the project is actually delivered, they can continue to benefit from uh, what we have done together. Interesting. That's, that's very valid points. And I think you mentioned, I mean, this journey that you take the customer on, right? Like from that's start true. to end, it's, it's long and yeah. there's multiple stages. Okay. Imtiaz, I mean, from a visualization and a, and a business intelligence side, I think ironically that is a facet of analytics that does not have a lot of light shed on it. It's seen as kind of you know your your background work. It's not the the fancy thing that's that's in the in the now, right? I, ironically, even though it's the kind of front end work, it's it's not seen as you know sexy essentially. So I wanted to understand, like from your point of view, how important is visualization in that storytelling journey that Vinay was mentioning, and what are the key aspects you consider uh, technically? Yeah. Yeah, so I think uh, both Bindya uh, and Yusuf uh, highlighted key points, right? Levan, when Yusuf, when he was giving, uh, delivering his ideas, he was mentioning the importance of having a clear or maintaining clear communication. Whereas uh, Bindya was talking about, you know, how we demonstrate value to the end user. I think both of these are like key points. Um, that we can use when it comes to, you know, uh, uh, delivering uh, visualization or dashboards and things like that. So when we say uh, data visualization, it's all about, you know, how you translate your data into uh, like visual representation. Like so when we say visual representation, it could be things like um, graph, charts, maps, etc. So the, the main objective of this visualization is to communicate information and uh, give like key insights to the business so that you know it will they will be able to you know understand and interpret themselves uh, so when we look at you know the importance there are key 
um, like key factors that we need to keep in mind. So uh, data visualization is all about uh, helping people to understand uh, and see patterns, right? We, and trends within the data that usually uh, users may not be seeing if they are looking at, you know, some like huge amount of Excel data um, so that, you know, it will make their lives easier for them to, you know, understand um the complexity uh, and make you know uh, quick decisions and also uh, when we say uh, when we develop these visualization it will save a lot of time for the business units uh, and end users uh, obviously because you know previously they have been doing certain things manually or they may be referring to certain uh, excel documents where you know uh, all these information are not in one place right so Visualization helps a lot in terms of bringing all these things into one place and visually representing them. And uh, generally speaking, uh, people are, you know, tend to remember um, things if we, you know, present them uh, visually rather than, you know, using text and numbers. Uh, so uh, if we present certain information visually, it will, you know, help them to uh, recall certain important details. So I think those are some of the, you know, uh, important things uh, you need to consider when it comes to you know, data visualizations. Adil, if I might add on, uh, I think uh, the power of uh, color and uh, shapes and basically spacing out things to uh, make quick decisions uh, can be uh, extremely powerful and uh, it's communication at a almost the next level in, in, in some ways. Uh, yes. uh, we, we really underestimate uh, how important it is to think through that part of the experience. And there is a lot of, if, if you go back to your theme of skill today, Adil, I feel the uh, it is an underrated thing where if we feel sometimes uh, someone has a capability in Power BI, uh, it does not mean that necessarily they will be able to turn out something that is uh, meaningfully uh, uh, impactful to the business, right? So you could have five tables and you could have charts and graphs and things like that. Uh, and then maybe the objective that is uh, meant uh, to be achieved for someone on the ground uh, may actually get more complicated and you might not really be able to uh, smoothen the process for them and help them with that decision. Sometimes it might be two or three things, maybe a few a, a traffic light that tells you, hey, yes, go for this, drawing their, uh, drawing their decision making along uh, is, 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 is an important part of the process uh, when you consider analytics and uh, even advanced analytics as we do. And, and also just to add on to that, I think, uh, um, I think rightly you pointed out, Yusuf, I think um, before that we need to sort of, you know, understand uh, the pain points of the users. That is one critical aspect uh, when it comes, you know, data visualization. Uh, because if you don't address that pain point, then no, no matter, you know, how good you are at uh, developing dashboard, it won't, you know, add value to the uh, organization. So it is always important for us to understand what, uh, the client requests uh, it could be you know minor things you know like adding colors you know uh, formatting um, the, the labels and things like that but at the end of the day it will add a lot of value to the uh, end user because uh, you can't say you know this is a small thing and we should ignore it because everything matters at the end so uh, the most important thing for us is to understand what the client wants and how to see how best we can address his requirement interesting i mean now you guys have been talking about sort of like what you do i think on the job right like the, the skills that you're using on the job like listening effectively to the clients and then adapting your solutions to make sure they are tailored for exactly what your client's requirement is if if you're looking at someone who's coming into the industry or just leaving university what are some things they can do right now that can help make them better at those skills that you're talking about, about like effectively listening more effectively to your client and better critical thinking in terms of, you know, building, building those dashboards and their solutions. Maybe Yusuf, is there anything you would suggest to someone who is transitioning into the field or, or attempting to get into the field right now, anything they can do with what they have right now uh, to make themselves a better data analytics profession? Uh, yeah, I think uh, the curiosity is uh, uh, something that uh, I, mean, I don't know if it's a skill as such, but it's something that uh, is is really important. Um, and uh, I mean, I mean, maybe some people are born with it, some people aren't. But if you were to uh, 
in, to be successful uh, in this field, you really have to be uh, very curious about how things work. Uh, I think Kintias was talking about the visualization and understanding why even a small change uh, of a color or a font or a formatting can be uh, so powerful. Uh, you will not understand that without having the curiosity as to why uh, this is something that could be useful. You know, we might think of someone who's on the field as not being very important and he doesn't know what's happening in the back end and all these wonderful models we are using. Uh, but if you really think about what will create the business uplift, uh, it could be the speed of that person engaging with that particular dashboard. Uh, it could be how convinced that this person is that the data that is being given to him to support his decision. You know, uh, should I go out and uh, make these sales visits or should I go out and make sales visits in this part of the town? Why would I trust this? Why would I believe this? In order for you to put yourself into a position uh, and uh, this is what Vindya was talking about earlier as well in terms of the journey. If you have to put yourself into a position where you take someone uh, along uh, their ride and you buy them in and you get their conviction, you will certainly have to start with understanding what is important to them. So you know, taking an interest in going into the details of a particular industry, understanding how things tick and being able to quickly um, empathize from a business and operational point of view about what's going on uh, on the field and in the boardroom uh, is is something that uh, is a is something that someone should uh, seek to do so there's lots of of course courses and things like that in uh, i mean if you if you think about it from a business point of view there are different things around value chains and uh, aspects like that that can be picked up through you know, uh, like even courses like in your graduate degrees or postgraduate degrees, but there is a lot of content out there, small, short courses to understand particular industries. But you are not going to, it's not going to be of any use if uh, you look at that on your tablet or on your laptop and you learn it and you pass that course. But when you, you know, travel uh, uh, to some place and you look at, say, for example, the price of a fish bun, if you are not curious about why the price of the fish bun has gone up and what the correlation between the price of the fish bun is and the, the gas price or the diesel price and things like that and understand and empathize with the bakery uh, that you are at as to what makes it tick, uh, then there's a whole lot of, I mean, all those courses are not going to be very useful to you. So how can you sort of work on that skill? It's basically to be very curious about what's going on around you and try to uh, get into the details, talk to people and uh, elicit knowledge in that area really yeah i think i mean a common theme we seem to be hitting quite a lot is going into always being inquisitive and always asking questions that passion for learning has has to be there right to, to succeed in this industry and you also mentioned i think learning about the the industries or the subject domains that uh, you're interested in now vindya i know you work across multiple domains and a common worry that a lot of people have including myself is how much do you have to know about the subject matter when you when you start dealing with these clients, right? Like how how do you, is this built over time while you work with them? How do you navigate that? Um, so Adil, in my case, of course, when I started working in these uh, new sectors, I actually didn't have much experience at all. I was from the service sector and now I am in the consumer foods in the retail sectors. And of course, you need to have the passion to learn, like you've super emphasized. You need to get into the details. You need to have conversations. You need to have good people skills to understand the business. So basically, um, it's very important that you observe, you study, and you learn about this industry. It can be through conversations and observing what your particular client is doing. You could also read up on the uh, matter uh, there's so much of content available on the internet on similar projects that are being done uh, across the globe so i mean it's not mandatory that you need to have experience in a particular environment for you to actually um, you know do analytics in that environment because you are working with a client and you do have the opportunity to learn about the industry i think what you need to focus on is uh, using the first principles of basically having uh, uh, a good understanding of what the business is basic um, financial knowledge on you know uh, what is the profitability of that industry how do they measure profitability 
what are the key drivers of success for that industry? So those are things that, yes, um, through conversations, uh, through discussions that you can actually learn. And um, something I would also like to emphasize is that you have to be resilient in this industry uh, because the first solution that you bring in to um, the client may not be accepted by them. And there may be so many aspects that you've actually missed out because obviously you may not have the experience that the client has um, in that domain to like bring in the perfect solution the first time. So you should have the resilience to actually go back work on your solution, enhance it and come back with something better. And it will always be an iterative process where you actually build the solution, like I said before, with the client and come up with the best outcome. Nicely put, Vindya. Just before we... Uh, that, yeah, sorry, Adil, if I might add to that, I think uh, picking up on the tail end of what Vindya was saying about the client and uh, uh, his stakeholder management and change management, uh, is fantastically important, right? I mean, we can all uh, go and do uh, courses online and build little models on our laptops or in cloud spaces. But when it boils down to it, you have to uh, work on your uh, people skills and work on uh, facing the fact that change management is something you need to do actively. People have, uh, I mean, everyone, people are in their comfort zones. People have a way of doing things. People have a way uh, that they feel comfortable when they come into work that the decisions they made from their gut or from the last five or ten years of experience uh, these things are what make them you know make them who they are and suddenly we are asking for changes to uh, not only the way they do things but their belief systems in some ways as well so it's not something that we should take lightly that hey you know we are, we have a great solution here uh, take it and run with it right and why is it that you can't understand how important this uh, complex solution is and we are using so many thousands or millions of data points and what is it about this that you can't believe uh, that kind of attitude uh, is, is is going to fall flat but also having that awareness that you need to work on people and need to buy them in uh, is critical uh, not only for implementation, but also, at, as Vindya said, to come up with a great solution, it's an iterative process. So if you are going to be someone who is prescribing uh, medicine to your patient, then that's that's just not the kind of relationship that uh, uh, you can have with customers and uh, the other stakeholders. And, and when we keep saying the term stakeholder, and you need to call this out because uh, you have different people involved. You have some uh, someone who would sponsor your program, and then you'd have someone who is the person who owns your project, and then you'd have the guys at the front, right, on the field who are taking uh, some of these things and actually acting on it. It's their lives that are going to be either made more efficient or uh, made uh, easier, right? So if you don't have buy-in from them, and if you don't work on the buy-in, and if you don't have that ability to uh, engage them, uh, then you are not going to be a great uh, evangelist for data. Right? I mean, it's it's all very well to sit in a room and uh, come up with something, but the real impact and the impact that people pay for is what happens uh, on the field or with the customers. Yeah, I think, I mean, what's very clear is it's, it's a two-way street, right? There's give and there's take. It's not like industries where you're simply telling someone what to do. They will obviously have feedback for you based on their own experience and expertise that you will have to take and reevaluate. Yeah. Just before we move on to the next uh, segment, I'd just like to invite the audience to please uh, enter any questions that you have for our panelists in the chat, and we'll kind of work our way through them as, as we go along too. I think moving on, Imtiaz, again, coming back to... Uh, more technical requirements. A lot of people are interested to know what the best tool is to learn in 2023, what the best, you know, dashboarding technology there is to learn. What what suggestions do you have for people if they have to kind of uh, get involved in, in analytics? What are your thoughts on how they should structure their approach in that way? Yeah, so uh, there are, to answer your question, Adil, I think there are many tools that are available in the market. Um, I mean, to name a few, there are yeah. there is Power BI, there is Tableau, there is ClickSense, um, so many tools that are available. So the selection of a tool uh, depends on the individual user's specific needs and requirements. Uh, like, 
and also like before you select a particular tool, there are you know certain things that you need to focus on. One is the the tool that you select should be you know very easy to use. OK, and then, uh, you know, there are certain tools where um, there are limitations in terms of the visualizations that you can use. Um, you know, there are certain features in certain uh, visualization tool that does not, you know, offer in terms of you know, data cleaning, data preparation, collaboration, etc. Uh, and the most important thing is uh, there is always a cost involved when we, you know, go ahead with uh, whatever tool that we decide. So we need to, I mean, clearly understand what that cost is um, and how um, how the organization is going to support that cost. Uh, and then the other key uh, point is like in terms of support, uh, whether there is, you know, readily available uh, support uh, when it comes, you know, because these are things that are, um, you know, for example, when we uh, work on a particular uh, dashboard requirement, like, um there are in for certain dashboards uh, there are certain communities that are available where if we want uh, to um, get certain things clarified we um, write to them and we get their support so there's always there is support that is available for certain tools whereas for other tools uh, you don't get those support so it is always important to understand that uh, if the support is there then you will be able to you know um, clarify all your doubts with regards to um, your you know concerns that you have so i mean once we identify all these factors it is important for us to you know narrow down uh, and select what the best visualization tool that you would need uh, but my suggestion is before going into all of those things like there are uh, free demo versions that are available um, on all of these tools, right? So each and everyone who is interested in um, moving into, you know, data visualization can try on these uh, different uh, visualization tool and experience yourself. So that's so that when I started my introduction, that's how I, you know, I, the the way that I learned visualization is also similar to that. Uh, I had to use multiple visualization tools. Uh, to see the benefit uh, and identify which tool is the best. So likewise, it's it's a try and error method that you have to use uh, where you have to uh, use different visualization tools and identify which is the most preferred tool for you. Interesting. I mean, and I think from a technical side of things, there are these kind of readily available free to use like tools that you can upscale in and get qualifications in. Yusuf and Vindya, yes, I think I'll keep exactly. it open to of you from a delivery perspective or from a, uh, a perspective of someone who maybe is it does not have like a, a like a specific core competency it's, it's a mix of a an amalgamation of soft skills right what do you all look for uh, for a person who is going to succeed in this industry in the roles that you're like i think you said you already touched upon i mean being curious uh, having the ability to think on your feet and being a good communicator is there anything you look out for particularly uh, in terms of like personality that that stands out to you as someone who, you know, can can succeed in this field. What what does it take? Yeah. Uh, yeah. If I may go ahead, uh, I think being very structured is, is 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 important, right? I think you have to think in a very structured way, and you have to also look at you know connecting the dots and being able to uh, relate. I mean, there's a huge element of storytelling, but that storytelling is not going to emerge if you don't connect those dots in your head yourself. So your ability to take a, a, a space, right? Whether, as I said in the previous example, is it a, are you able to go into a bakery and understand how the, the bakery owner makes money? And are you able to go and then understand how the Chun Pan guy who goes and sells it uh, in the streets, how does he make money, right? And what are his challenges and how does he deal with his stakeholders? Is there something to do with, you know, the traffic patterns that he takes into account? And is there, what is his value unlock? understanding hey this is what makes me tick so today it could be that but tomorrow you might have to go in and understand the credit process in a finance company right and then how do how do they evaluate that so there's a set of tools and a set of skills that you put together and your uh, it goes back again I, you know i'm going on about curiosity but i feel that focusing on being able to tell a story end to end 
uh, be, because people love to listen to stories, right? So even just narrating something, saying, hey, uh, sir, is this how your business works? Tell me if I'm wrong, right? This is how you add value. This is where you get, uh, uh, right, everybody. This, uh, do I understand you correctly when I say that your costs are probably, uh, this is your main uh, cost, etc. Uh, things like that and being able to make people uh, understand in a simple way and uh, fill in the blanks, then, you know, they might say, hey, hang on, you you missed this out, right? A really important part of it is uh, to be able to wake people up at 5.30 in the morning. And, uh, you know, we are an important part of their routine and um, people love us and that's, uh, you know, we are not a nuisance. We are something that's uh, important to society. And then, you know, we might, the recommendation might be there to come up with a, uh, an algorithm uh, based uh, uh, tune uh, that uh, isn't is, is instead of being aggressively waking people up wakes them up in a calm manner and that might be a value add from a AI point or a you know a, a tool point of view but putting your finger on the fact that how does this particular person differentiate uh, being able to think about that and being able to uh, seek to solve his problem I think uh, is, uh, uh, is, is, is is really important yeah Um, to add on to what Yusuf is saying, I think we've uh, talked about many um, qualities that we look for um, for pe professionals in this field, uh, especially on the delivery aspect. And one more thing I would like to add on there are the list critical thinking and problem solving. So those are two very important aspects that as a delivery professional that you would need to have because you actually work as the conduit between um, the technical team as well as um, the business units, the clients, the customers. So you need to um, have those problem solving skills to basically see whether the business problem is actually being translated into a solution by uh, the technical team that will be adopted by the clients. So therefore, the critical thinking is very, very important. Have you thought through all the possible solutions that you can bring in into a particular problem? Have you exhausted all options? Is this really the best option? Can you break down a problem into more subsections? Have you touched on every aspect of the solution? So that level of critical thinking is important. And Maybe it's not something you can develop overnight. It requires practice and it's something that you would gain by working in the industry, working with different people. And that's why the whole resilience is really important um, so that over time you can build these skills and you can become um, quite good at them. And then uh, you can really um, enhance your career and be um, a, uh, you know, a really good professional in this field. And I think you mentioned in your answer there that there's a lot of uh, collaboration, right? There's both inter like among the teams with the clients. In any industry, teamwork is important for sure. But I think in ours, more so than anywhere else, there are people who are still such different disciplines that it's important that we don't work in silo, right? That the team kind of works together to create this one uh, solution. Maybe, Yusuf, is there anything you can add on how how you collaborate on a day-to-day -day basis and how important it is to making sure that that end product is is valuable to the customer yeah i um, i think you have to start from a common ground uh, that that's important to uh, agree what the common ground is and uh, if i just relate this back to skill uh, it's that skill to be able to elicit the common ground and it, it works both ways one is how do you probe and find out what is it that makes this person tick and what is the common ground that we can both agree on? Is it I, maybe it's a, it's a metric or maybe it's a transformation? What is good for us? Um, I think one, one, I'd like to break that into two parts. One part of it is uh, how do you elicit that? But the other part of it is how do you keep an open mind? Because you have to show that openness and that commitment to coming to a solution, uh, not to foist something on someone, not to push something down someone's throat. When people feel that there is that sense of agreement and you actually work towards that, I mean, I, I hate to sound corny, but if there is a synergy that emerges right, because they will look out for you and they will sort of fill in the gaps in your uh, process, right? And if you look at the other way around, you know, you, you they will keep an open mind to the crazy ideas that you will be willing to build to the table, right? They, they might be like, hey, 
Uh, in fact, in many cases, when we iterate, we find that the business user it brings better ideas than we would know because they, there's so many things that, that they don't really um, uh, weren't aware that we could do and we weren't aware that could be done. So uh, building a common ground and uh, a platform from which you can build, if you don't do that, you'll be just sort of creating deliverables, writing code, generating reports, but you won't have conviction and then that can be quite frustrating. Right. So I, I would say that uh, um, uh, having a good alignment and a chemistry uh, and as and, and as Vindya said, I mean, just the absolute resilience uh, because uh, and patience because people will take time to understand what you're saying and uh, you will get shot down and uh, you will, by nature of uh, the work, it is iterative. So uh, uh, being able to sort of be honest to the solution uh, in your head, uh, is something that you have to uh, really uh, re really be clear about, right? It's not about doing a job of work and uh, or maybe doing a task where you come and deliver a task. You have to really work with the others and uh, make sure that, that you know, it, it could be, I mean, if I just go into a bit more detail, right? If, if a data pipeline has to run and it has to run at 6 a.m. so that someone can see it at 7 a.m., Right. It, it cannot be you have to look at going the extra mile to optimize the code. Maybe the input pipeline comes in only at five o'clock. How can I make this code something that runs within 20 minutes and processes 100,000 records? Now, you can only uh, make that happen and you can only negotiate. Maybe you can go back and negotiate with the, the business user and say, hey, um, what if I get give this to you by 630? Will that work? So when you work together, you will sort of, it goes away, the, the whole idea of hey, saying, hey, this is the spec and you need to deliver it exactly like this, goes away and you kind of work together and iterate for solutions that are better. Right? You might end up with an iterative solution that says that, look, you give me 50% of the records by seven o'clock, but I only need to see the other 50% of the records by 10 o'clock, right? because something else happens there. So that that you will never uh, be able to elicit if you don't both, I mean, the person on the other end is ready to, uh, not hold you to something and they want to work with you, but you also having that openness where you say, I have a limitation here, right? But how can we make this work into something that works for both of us? So uh, again, just to raise that common ground, right? So uh, the, uh, if you don't seek that from the beginning and uh, uh, like we, we, have, we, we have been conditioned uh, as maybe I speak for myself and everyone out here is uh, much less conditioned to this, but uh, we have been conditioned uh, when we learn something uh, that we are learning it because it is right. Uh, then, and that may not necessarily be the case, right? So we always come into discussions with a view to saying, hey, this is what I am bringing to the table. And uh, I don't think you necessarily need to do that. I think you need to say, this is something that we can work on together. So trying to unlearn some of the things that we have uh, sort of uh, uh, conditioned ourselves to over the years uh, and being conditioned uh, even during education that, you know, this is the way it is done. One plus one is always going to be two. Uh, that the, being able to uh, flex that and, uh, you know, be, be committed to a common goal is really, really important. Yeah. Sorry, I keep going on about this, but I feel it's one of the things that's been a major unlock for us. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's hitting a lot of insight for the people out there as well. I, we're just getting some questions coming in. Please keep adding to them. I think um, Shamil has a really good question here. Something that I think we all face on a daily basis, right? Which is um, you're given a requirement and there's kind of like the, the detailed way to go about it. And then there's the bigger picture. Now, sometimes we lose track of the bigger picture because we get so involved in the granular level of detail like almost the what the infamous saying of like analysis paralysis right and i think what shamli is trying to ask is do you all have any kind of inputs or suggestions or even examples of how maybe zooming out looking at the bigger picture uh, having a more simpler solution is sometimes the answer um so i'll take that question adil so basically, I mean, of course, yes, that is why this whole um, we had this conversation around resilience, because when we um, start off on a project, there is this uh, there is this tendency that we might go down one path and we may uh, lose track or not uh, see the uh, full picture of the solution and which is why uh, we also touched upon the importance of having uh, the involvement of um, the customer or the client from the initial stages so that we can actually um, uh, sound our solution uh, with them and kind of get their view on what we are doing 
And something we also uh, do uh, when we try to build solutions is also to trial it. We trial it with um, a smaller subset of um, whoever we are working with and to see the actual results. And something that is really important also is to have a good measure of success. So when you have these things in place and uh, you are going on this with a quite a iterative, but also a very structured approach to uh, address the problem. So you will have the problem, um, but the solution is very exploratory. So you will build it iteratively and maybe there is um, a descriptive aspect uh, to the solution. Sometimes maybe the analytical aspect is 20%, but you have to do a lot of business process changes in order to truly get the value of that analytic solution. So when you actually work with the client and the customer, your solution should just not be your analytic solution or the numbers part only. You should work with them to give them a holistic solution where you also look at what are the business processes you need to change. Um, is there a more descriptive way, uh, uh, like Shamin has asked, in uh, finding a solution, what are the process changes we need to make? Maybe it's some very small change that we need to make to a daily routine of someone, which will really unlock value. So all those aspects we need to see, and um, that it can only be achieved by uh, actually uh, approaching it in a very structured manner and also having the client involved from day one. Fascinating. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's way to anyone else have anything to add? Sorry. I think uh, Arshad also had a had a very good question. I think we've touched on it earlier, essentially on the types of courses that you can do, how much time you should invest in if you want to pivot to analytics as a career. But one, I think, important phase is how they can stand out when they're applying, when they're being screened. Imtiaz, as someone who actually did make that shift, right, from a from an auditing background into analytics, what can you do? How can you show that passion without actually being in the industry? What are some things you can do and what have you done, for example, to, to show that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so obviously, um, I mean, before we uh, go into this, more like a uh, visualization side of it we should obviously have passion to learn uh, it's not that you um, do something today and then uh, uh, one week's time you try and see whether you know you get the hangout of it for example so uh, it's something that you need to continuously develop and then uh, there are various courses that are available uh, things like you know data camp coursera uh, Udemy, uh, there are LinkedIn courses as well. And then if you're, you know, uh, planning to uh, do some Microsoft certified exams, there are th those as well available specifically for um, the visualization side of it. So uh, now I think in mean, most of the universities and stuff, they have added a curriculum on this visualization or the business intelligence as well. So uh, whoever who is pursuing that uh, side of it will be able to get more insights as well. So uh, the the bottom line is that uh, uh, there are all these resources available. There are YouTube videos. There are free documentations available. It's just that you have to. Um, it's not you read it today and you forget it tomorrow, right? You have to continuously learn all those things because, for example, these uh, visualization tools. There are always updates, regular updates that are coming, new ways of you know analyzing data. And the other important thing is once you uh, create a dashboard today, uh, there could be opportunities to optimize or do things differently uh, in your dashboard. So you have to always find ways on how to improve your dashboard or how to create this visual better for the end user, end user to understand. Uh, and also, I think just to touch upon the previous point, uh, what um, uh, Vindya mentioned about team management uh, or people skills. Uh, I think it's when it comes to visualization, it's very important to have that uh, team skills because it's not only you will be working alone uh, on developing dashboards. You have to work with multiple parties to make sure your final product is delivered to the client. 
so uh, sometimes you might need to work with the data engineering team who make sure that you know all the pipeline is being set up that the data is flowing smoothly you might need to uh, work with some of the data scientists uh, some of the uh, um, you know some of the support uh, the live ops team uh, in case if there are any change requests that comes for your dashboard and how that is getting communicated and how you uh, make those changes to the dashboard. So multiple parties will be involved um, in this whole exercise. So it's not only one individual that needs to work on this dashboard. So it's a team effort. So that is very, very important when it comes to um, you know developing visualizations for your clients. Thanks, Antias. I think just a quick note to uh, audience that we'll be closing the taking of questions by 2 p.m. So please enter in uh, any other questions that you have in the next 10 minutes. Akil actually had a good question on kind of the initiation or the ideation of an analytics project. So if he was to employ it in, in his company, how would you assess the feasibility of an analytics intervention for your current domain or your current field that you're working in? Yusuf, I think you have a lot of experience in this area. What are some attributes and factors that you take into consideration when you're assessing how well analytics, analytics can actually solve the problem that you have? Yeah, I think uh, uh, one of the simplest things that most business people do, right? Because someone pays our bills finally. Uh, so most business people use this sort of rule of thumb where it has to be whatever the solution is, has to give a sort of what you might call an uplift or a return on investment that is greater than what we are putting into it. So there's always a complexity or effort uh, to return comparison that we would do. I think most things can be iterated and solved for days and months on end. And then, you know, it's you'll get a solution, but then that would have affected five customers out of 5,000 or something like that. It doesn't make it doesn't really make sense in that way. So like like with any other technology or any other opportunity, we look for the low hanging fruit. Uh, there has to be a, a mix between if you're going taking an analytics based solution to a problem. You need to have something to analyze, right? There has to be a data set that will be uh, substantially uh, informative. Uh, you know, you can't take five anecdotes of someone and that doesn't make it a analytics uh, solution at all. And, and depending on your industry, 500 data points is also not going to be uh, very useful, right? It will probably end up misleading you and you will probably not have the analytical rigor that is needed. So I, I think where I'm going with this uh, to uh, to answer the question is you have to really start off by saying, what do I have uh, if I have uh, you know a body of data? Uh, and then I look at, hey, I have this body of data on one side of the table, and uh, these are the major unlocks in my business. So for example, if I was running a company that was uh, delivering things, one of my major cost bases would be, uh, for example, the cost of diesel, right? If I'm assuming I'm using diesel or electricity or whatever it is, whatever my fuel cost is, right? So if if I can do something that helps me reduce these the diesel cost, which is 30% of my business expenses, right? I would like be like, hey, yeah, sure, maybe there is something that I can do, right? So then, if it's deliveries, if I'm using, if I have a fleet and I have 100% fleet utilization during a day, is there some way that I can? look at combining certain deliveries during the day and can the analytics tell me uh, whether I can go from 90 uh, from 100 to 95 vehicles being used during a day and I will save the diesel of five vehicles right is there some way that I can combine it is there some way that we can maybe uh, look at offering the customer uh, a discount if there's a delay or is there some way of offering instead of uh, one day delivery you give two day delivery and you save the diesel and then you give a small rebate to the customer and you can test all these scenarios out. And as Vindya said, you can do something like a pilot. So uh, that's just to paint a picture of how you might take on a, such a solution. But you have to really be clear if you're not saving the diesel, I mean, just put the code away, right? I don't think there's any point in uh, uh, starting out. And, and buy-in is everything, uh, ladies and gentlemen. I think uh, it's a new area. And uh, we are, we, even in the most sophisticated businesses, there are people who are by uh, definition experts because they have done something in a different way, right? So you have to build buy-in and uh, being able to justify uh, things is much easier if you are going to make some money out of it in the process. So pick something where you will make a saving or you will get an uplift 
uh, maybe something that will increase your uh, the number of sales leads or and your conversion quality or something like that, which can be relate, relate directly to the bottom line. Uh, and that should also be something that can be done in a period that is six months or a year or something where people can back you up when you start the exercise. Um, and finally, of course, don't start unless you have a, a reasonable amount of data because then you will be second guessing your solutions and saying, hey, should I have done this? Should I trust the data? So, uh, I mean, those are some very broad uh, thoughts around that area. Uh, Thanks, Yusuf. And I think speaking of, I mean, having data, right? I think we have all encountered at least one project that we worked on where you started and then you realize that you don't have the data and to go back to uh, square one, pretty much. Hasini has actually asked a question on essentially in that journey of deploying a, a solution, starting off with the customer in terms of what data they have, taking that data in, analyzing it, and then giving them a final product. What are the risks? What are some key blockers that you guys have seen on a regular basis based on your experience, some pain points that you need to be aware of? Vindya, from your experience, what, what do you think are some kind of red, not red flags, but maybe things to be aware of going into the, into the journey? Yeah. Um, so something we need to be uh, aware of Adil from uh, the onset is that we need to ensure that the data we have is accurate. So data integrity is something that is very important um, so that we know that what we are working with is accurate and something we can build a solution. So if we get a data set, we need to know the authenticity of that data and how accurate is the updating of that data. So if there are like 100 people updating the data set, what is the quality of that data that we are receiving? Are there any data quality checks that are done? Maybe is the client already doing those quality checks? Do we need to clean up the data uh, before we start uh, you know, running our analytics models on it? So when we have a data set, it's very important that we first look at the data and understand the quality of that data because the quality of the data will determine the solution that you're going to give. So something that we all, I mean, I've faced um, in my analytics journey is, uh, you know, ensuring this data quality. Like if you are conducting a survey to gather data, um, you have to ensure that the data that is being collected is accurate and is of good quality. Um, if not, you can build the best model, but if you're going to feed in inaccurate data, your solution is going to be absolutely rubbish. And that's not something um, the client is going to accept. And they will also wonder why we are giving some solution that is not adaptable to them. So therefore, uh, I think the key thing is to make sure that the quality of the data that you're working with is good. So that's something that we have to start on. Like when we are starting on an analytics project, like Yusuf said, there has to be a significant body of data and that data has to be of a, uh, uh, at least a reasonable level of quality in order for us to build on it. So um, I think that would be my answer like in a I mean, we've had so many instances where the data quality has been questionable. And, um, you know, when we are even in trial stage that we've had to, uh, you know, relook at the solution, rework the solution, because we've realized that the initial quality of our data has not been uh, accurate. So that actually, um, I mean, it's something that it's a iterative process again, because it's not something that you can guarantee at the beginning. And it's something that you would have to work on uh, on an ongoing basis. There can be technical issues where the data is inaccurate. There can be human issues where the data is inaccurate. But it's something that you have to always be aware of and always you need to ensure, like even on a once the uh, uh, solution is delivered and on a BAU basis that data quality checks need to continue to make sure that what we are processing and the solution that we are deriving from that data is uh, of good uh, standard. I think a lot of what you mentioned links back to a point that Yusuf made earlier as well about structured thinking, right? The most structured mm -hmm. you're thinking is the risk there are that you're going down a rabbit hole and then end up all the way back in square one. So, that's that's a common theme and interesting that you you brought it up as well. So, MTS, you wanted to say something? Yeah, so I just 
wanted to add on to uh, what Vindya mentioned. So uh, definitely data accuracy is something that uh, you need to um, uh, have in mind. Um, I mean, from a visualization perspective, uh, so what I see is uh, when we connect into, you know, different databases, different tables, uh, what we do is we uh, import the entire um, table level information for our dashboard development, right? I think there's a uh, someone's mic is unmuted. If you could just please go on mute. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so what I was saying is that you now when we connect to different databases and we extract uh, information from the databases, uh, so the common mistake that we do is we uh, extract all the information that are there in that particular table, right? So what happens is when we develop dashboards and we uh, start to refresh the dashboards, it might um, arise in performance issues. So we need to always, uh, from a visualization standpoint, it is always important for us to identify what are the critical um, fields that is required uh, from a particular table uh, to develop this dashboard. And those are the unnecessary fields that we need to extract. The other point what we need to keep in mind is the volume of data, right? So if we are performing an analysis which involves, you know, um, analyzing records which are uh, more than 1 million or 2 million records, and if we are doing this on a continuous basis, we need to make sure all our infrastructures are available, which means includes the storage, the processing facilities, everything should be um, up to date. Um, otherwise, you might fall into different issues when we are analyzing large volumes of data. So just to add on to what Vindya mentioned. Thanks, Itias. I think we have a final question we'll take from uh, Rifti, who's mentioned uh, that he would like to know what the trending data analytics tools are. I think we've already touched on the fact that there are lots of tools and really it's not about the tool, it's about the the processes and the, the the way of thinking that you build while learning those tools but i think one thing that's trending right now certainly and is always part of the conversation are large language models and mainly i mean chat gpt, chat GPT and the evolution of ai right in in the space are there any any kind of concerns that i mean when i'll come to you any any concerns that people should have about chat gpt possibly replacing what we do in our day-to-day -day roles or is it some is it a tool that we can use to empower uh, our day-to-day -day work life. Um, so Adil, I will answer this question in this manner. So, I mean, when we have technology and we go into territory that is uncharted, there's always this question of whether is it going to take over the world or, you know, is there any risk um, to any particular jobs uh, from uh, a particular AI tool? But I think uh, what we need to focus on is what is the value um, some technology is bringing because every aspect of or every technology i mean like now we are talking about ai and deep learning and all of that but maybe um, you know a millennia ago inventing the wheel was also technology at that stage so i mean inventing um, the steam engine so so there has been like an evolution of technology over the years and with technology yes there are certain risks because i mean with technology are we using it ethically is always a question and i think that is for um, a different audience to debate but i think it's, uh, what we need to focus on is what is the value that technology is bringing is it going to enhance um, our life is it going to add value to someone um, is it what is the benefit it's going to bring and if that is the case then it's something that we should definitely develop and pursue I and mean, i would like to answer it in that way well, so if i might add to that yes uh, if I might add to that, uh, uh, then this is more secondhand observation, which I got from uh, my team, right? Uh, and when I was asking them about what they think the skills are, uh, I think one of the important skills that uh, was shared was uh, things like algebra and statistics and uh, strong math fundamentals. And one of the things that really struck me is how um, they had also gone through a journey where they had been uh, enamored by various tools and they had looked at for example um, I won't even go into the examples uh, and they found that hey for me to be able to understand this particular aspect my core understanding of mathematics and statistics and how these things work needs to be a lot stronger and 
like these were people who had you know spent time in the industry and they gone back and spent time learning that again or relearning it because having that base foundation unlocks a lot more value from these tools so even to understand how some of the newer and more sophisticated models work uh, a person i will call myself a lay person in this industry we would not be able to unlock it as someone who has got has spent time and has got a real good grounding in how for example a neural network works right it, it, you need to have a base level of knowledge to be able to make the best out of that and to be able to unlock it so i would i don't think it's uh, many of these tools are I mean, chat GPT, for example, looks very uh, uh, turnkey, right? Ready to go. It's adding value. Sure, it's adding value in some basic scenarios. Uh, but if you want it to, re to really unlock what's hidden underneath it and to uh, evolve it to your own uh, use cases, it requires a certain number, a certain amount of base understanding. And investing in that is, is a no, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it cannot be avoided. So I thought I'd just add that there since we were talking skills in the context of tools. Thanks, Yusuf. I think with that, as we'll wrap up the, the Q&A. First, firstly, I want to give a shout out to Upul as well. Thank you for your very detailed uh, answers in the chat as well to some of the questions. Uh, just, I think, to, to close it off, right? Uh, first, I'll, I'll allow you some time uh, once we go around to give any, any closing remarks or any points you want to finish up on. But for the 100 people who have stayed on this, this call today, what would be if you were, we've got the better part of three months left in the year. If by the 1st of January, 2024, you only had enough, that amount of time to invest in a certain skill, a certain competency, even a specific certificate qualification, whatever it may be, what do you think is that one thing that someone should do if they want to advance their career in this industry and, and essentially help them to move forward? Imtiaz, maybe we'll start with you. Yeah, so uh, I think um, Adil, one thing is uh, everyone that I would, I mean, whoever who is interested in the visualization, I would want to tell is that um, to try starting on using a particular tool. I mean, you don't need to go into a um, extend level, but you can use a small data set within your organization, use the different tools that are available. There are so many demo versions that are available, right? Use some of those tools and try to, you know, get some insights out of it. And you should always have the passion uh, to learn. I mean, you should not stop at there. Uh, and also it is very important for you to uh, build your communication skills um, and some of these insights that you are getting out of these dashboards, you have to communicate to your um, senior uh, managers and all. So you have to develop that skills as well. So that is, I think I would, I would say the important thing that you have to uh, uh, learn the next three months. I, would fit out. Thank you. I mean, I think you cheated my question a little bit by adding more than one thing, but Vindya, I'm going to force you to only have one one takeaway for the audience. <laughs> okay. Um, so if I'm to select one, Adil, I would say um, learn a database querying language, maybe something like SQL, because we are working with data and um, that's fundamental uh, in order for you to work with data. So um, since you're giving me only one option, I will go with SQL. And uh, finally, Yusuf, coming to you. Yeah, I think India stole my answer. So, uh, but on the communication <laughs> side, so I, I mean, I, I really uh, am passionate about uh, storytelling, right? I think uh, whether uh, in every stage of our journey, right, whether we are at the beginning of the baking cycle, where we are just trying to identify what the opportunities are, you need to be able to tell a story about why you need to paint a picture of about why we should go along with this particular analysis. When you get to the end where you have to implement this on the ground, you need to go and tell the story again to a different set of stakeholders and you need to get them bought in. So, uh, I mean, it's my favorite uh, skill to uh, share with everyone. And how do you do this? I think you really have to practice the skill. This is something else that uh, my team was sharing and they were also sharing this in terms of uh, the other technical skills as well, right? Like go, yeah, go do Kaggle, go. Um, go and do stuff. And I want to take that same thing with uh, this. So if your if your businesses, if your groups, uh, uh, your educational groups, institutions have an opportunity for you to do something like Toastmasters, 
Speechcraft. Uh, take every opportunity to go up there, put yourself out there, tell a story, um, uh, think about it, right? Challenge yourself, be excited every week about going back and talking about something, right? Uh, pick some fundamental change, something historical. Uh, take an annual report from some uh, uh, particular company and, you know, uh, talk about the chart, chart the story of their rise, right? And why, for example, it has NVIDIA's, why is NVIDIA in a position today uh, where it is, uh, you know, untouchable in terms of the AI chip uh, space. What got them there? Tell that strategy story. Right? Make it simple for someone who doesn't understand. Grab your mom, grab your dad and tell them, look, hey, uh, you understand the money part of this, right? You understand why the share price has gone up. Right? Start with that and explain to them, look, this is why, for example, NVIDIA has got here. Uh, you know, go explain to them something maybe that's we do all the time. Why is it that everyone likes an iPhone? Uh, sorry, I, I'm, I'm an Android user, but still, why is it that that works that way, right? What is the value that it adds? Try to make these stories something that normal people can understand. And then you practice that because it causes you to uh, be curious. And uh, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to uh, uh, tell that as the uh, my my uh, my one skill to leave behind, yeah. Thanks, Yusuf. And I think, I mean, that, that sums it up nicely, right? I think we've hit across some key points which are common across everything that, that you three have spoken about during the past hour, right? We've got communication, we've got the, the critical thinking that Vindya, you said, draws out from, you know, learning a programming language, uh, making sure you're collaborating with your team well, and then obviously Imtia's competing upon, you know, the passion for learning, the curiosity, always asking why or how. I think all these things tie in together uh, and our combination of what makes a uh, data analytics professional. So I'd just like to thank all of you once again. I know you've got very busy schedules, uh, and I'd like to thank the audience as well for staying here for the little over an hour that we've, we've gone past. I hope we've answered all your questions. If you do have any further questions, please do feel free to reach out to our panelists. I'm sure their LinkedIn's and their emails will be posted uh, somewhere in, in, in a common uh, forum. And uh, with that, yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to everyone and hope you have a pleasant uh, Thursday evening. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening.